Thank you for all the organizers for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, I've been discussing in various combinations with people. So Kevin Lee, who would be here if he wasn't somewhere else. <laughs> Ehud Meir and Irakli Tachiporia, who are colleagues in Aberdeen. Um, but the blame for any sort of incoherent ramblings and wild speculation should lie with me. So this is more like um, not really a research presentation so much as a cry for help, because <laughs> I've become interested in these things which I know very little about, but um, people in this room may know more about, so I'd be happy to talk to people afterwards. So there are people, myself included, who when they see an interesting piece of mathematics ask, can this be done equivariantly? <laughs> and, um, Sometimes this means just putting G in front of everything, uh, but other times it means more. So a case in point is equivariant stable homotopy theory, the um, famous celebrated solution of the covariant variant one problem by Hill, Hopkins and Ravenel, where we learned things about the non-equivariant setting by understanding very well the equivariant setting. So that's a good example. Here's a potentially not so good example, but I'd like to explore anyway. So section one. Is there such a thing as equivariant geometric group theory? Google says not. <laughs> uh, maybe somebody in this room knows otherwise. The thing is, <laughs> geometric group theory is a, is a is the great idea of understand trying to understand groups by looking at how they act on spaces. And now I'm trying to say, uh, let's let a group act on a group acting on a space. And either I've gone mad or I'm studying higher categories or something like that. Uh, maybe there's a two group involved, I don't know. Um, so so what, what could I mean by this? So, Yeah, I'm not put, going to put G in front of everything because G was already there. So I'm going to put gamma in front of everything. Gamma is a group which are us will usually be finite. Um, and <clears throat> a gamma group is a group G. equipped with an action of gamma. Which I can think of as a, as a fixed homomorphism to the group of automorphisms of G. And now I want to consider a, um, a gamma equivariant G space. <coughs> Uh, by the way, G will usually be torsion free in my head if I don't if I don't say it. So a finite group acting on a torsion free group. A gamma equivariant G space, or for short, a gamma G space. is gonna be a G space X with a compatible gamma action. And you can guess what that means. So if uh, an element of G acts on X and then I act on that by gamma, the gamma action usually is written in a superscript on the left then that is the same as gamma acting on G, acting on gamma, acting on X. <clears throat> okay, and <clears throat> first thing you remark or you figure out is that this is nothing but a 
gamma G space where I'm pronouncing the semi-direct product of gamma acting on G, I should say G gamma, because I want to write it like, so same as <clears throat> a G semi-direct product gamma pronounced G gamma. Oh, now I've got gamma G and G gamma. <laughs> uh, anyway. So an element of the semi-direct product acts like this. And you check that it's the same, or well, you can translate into that. Um, and then the other thing is that I can take the orbits of a G action, and I still get a residual gamma action. If I, if I represent the orbit by GX, then gamma acting on that is gamma acting on G, acting on gamma acting on X. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Now I want to define a free gamma G space. And this is going to look a little bit contrived, and it actually is a bit contrived. I've reverse engineered the definition from what I want it to be. Uh, so, first of all, if X is G3, and second of all, I need a condition on the gamma action, but I don't want it to be a free action. Um, and what I want it to be is if an element of gamma fixes an orbit, then, well, not that gamma is the identity, but gamma fixes something in that orbit. So gamma HX equals HX to some H. So X is G free, does that just mean the action of G on X is free? Yes. So I, I have a free G space, I have an action of gamma on G and an action of gamma on X. And I insert this condition that if gamma fixes an orbit, it fixes, if, if an element of gamma fixes an orbit, then it fixes something in that orbit. Why? Why? Uh, because I, I, if you, if you don't want to listen to the rest of the talk, here's an exercise. <laughs> So a, a gamma G space is free, if and only if. X viewed as a, a G gamma space, G semi-direct product gamma space, has all its isotropy groups. in the following family of subgroups of the semi-direct product, which we call curly G. It's essentially the, the family generated by the gamma, which is the, the base of the semi-direct product. So that is all subgroups of the semi-direct product. Uh, which are conjugate to a subgroup of gamma. So H is G Q 
the inverse for some G and G Q subgroup of gamma. Uh, okay, so I secret I secretly uh, identify the gap the obvious gamma here with and write it as gamma. <laughs> um, so now this whole theory of uh, classifying spaces of groups with respect to families of subgroups. And so I know that there exists a universal <clears throat> free, I'll confuse myself, gamma G space. E curly G. So we got product which is a bit of a mouthful to write, so I'll just call it X. For now, and it, uh, so it has the property that any free gamma G space maps into it by a map which is unique up to equivariant homotopy. And it can be uh, identified by the looking at the fixed points. So, the H fixed points should be empty if H is not in the family and contractible if H is in the family. Okay. So examples. If I take G to be the free group on two letters, acted on by the group of order two by switching the letters. Then the the Cayley tree. If I'm pretending to do geometric group theory, I, I should draw this tree. <laughs> uh, but I'm not going to be very good at drawing it. Uh, I didn't leave myself enough space to draw it. Um, so generator A goes one way, B goes one way. And now I can act on this by just switching the roles of A and B. And I'm essentially going to reflect in a in the diagonal. This is a, a classifying space. Do you mean you mod out by reflecting the diagonal? No, so X has a, a G action, which is the usual one. And it also has a, a gamma action, which is this reflection. Mm -hmm. And those are compatible. So if I go somewhere by a group element and then reflect, mm -hmm. that's the same as going somewhere by the reflection of that group element and then reflecting. If that's what I wrote before. <laughs> Would you always take the Cayley graph of G and have gamma act on it? Uh, to get a classifying space. Well, maybe but if you get an interesting gamma G space. Uh, if you have an equivariant presentation, which is what I'm going to talk about. There's a map in the classifying space from gamma to the classifying space for G, semi-direct product gamma, right? And can you sort of look at the fiber of that for obstructions to see whether gamma actually gives an action, X, extends to an action on X and not just the next one B? 
Well, gamma does act on X. Um, oh, already, but it also yeah. descends to an action on the orbit. Right. Okay, I got confused. On the fixed point, so gamma has to have a fixed point. Yes. So the uh, I was going to write here the fixed points. The only vertex fixed by this is the trivial word. Because so you take a word in A and B and you swap A and B. So the only, so the isotropy of any vertex G is uh, the G conjugate of gamma. So I claim that um, this is empty if H is not a G conjugate of gamma. So it's not in the family. Uh, it's a single vertex G if we're looking at the, the G conjugate of gamma. And otherwise, it's all of X, which is a tree, hence contractible. Well, the only other case is uh, H is trivial because, because gamma is a group of order two. So. We're okay here, but like if you took a regroup, um, well, I'm just about to say actually, what happens? Like right, now, I've got to rub some stuff off. Any further questions? Can I do that? So here's a, a non-example. G to be the integers acted on by, again, the group of order two, this time uh, by the only non-trivial automorphism. Um, and then let X be, the real line so the the integers act by translation and the um the group of order two acts like this if we were looking at the, so the, well, the semi-direct product here is the infinite dihedral group. If we were looking at the family of all finite subgroups, then this would be a, a classifying space. But in this case, it's not because this is not a, a free gamma G space as I defined it because because the orbit of a half is fixed by this uh, action of gamma that doesn't have a fixed point. Okay, and this is kind of a, a geometric manifestation of the fact that inside this semi-direct product here, well, which is isomorphic to the free product of two copies of C2, there are, there are many copies, I think many, well, at least there are copies of C2 which aren't conjugate into the base. Two conjugacy classes. Two conjugacy classes, so not many. <laughs> Two that aren't, or two, 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 two altogether. One that is, and all together. So yeah, I'm going to ask about geometric dimension and cohomological dimension 
in this equivariant world. So the equivariant geometric dimension of the gamma group G is the minimum dimension of such a classifying space. Uh, there's a there's a corresponding algebraic notion which is harder to to explain. But if you've ever seen Bridon cohomology stuff, then you've met modules over the orbit category, uh, which form a nice abelian category which has enough projectives, and you can do group cohomology with these more general modules. <laughs> so uh, I'll write some stuff. So this is the uh, projective dimension of the constant Z module as a module over the orbit category. Now, this is a category where the objects are the kind of orbits with isotropy here. So they are just homogeneous spaces, this mod H, where H is in the family. And then you say equivariant maps between them. Anywho, that's a Redon cohomology. And then, well, you can then define these cohomology groups. So this will be the supremum of K, such that the Kth Redon cohomology is non-zero for some module. Okay, and something we did manage to prove a while back is an equivariant Generalization of the, the classical Stalling Swan theorem. So the cohomological dimension, the equivariant cohomological dimension is less than or equal to one. I say less than or equal to because if G is a trivial group, it can be zero. If and only if the geometric dimension is less than or equal to one if and only if G is free, but it's free with basis, uh, a gamma set. So it's free with a, a basis that gets permuted. So here, Yes, uh, there's a one dimensional classifying space and it was quite an obvious one here. Uh, we don't have a basis that gets permuted. We have this acting by negation uh, and the obvious one is not a classifying space. And in fact, the, the equivariant cohomological dimension here will be infinite because you can kind of do a, a Shapiro lemma type argument with the, the C2 that's not in the family. Um, and get that it's bounded below by the cohomological dimension of C2, which is which is infinite. <laughs> so this part here um, is fairly straightforward -ish to, to see. Uh, the hard part is the, uh, the cohomological dimension part. So um, we rely on a result of Dunwoody. I hope it's Dunwoody uh, about um, the case of Finn, um, cohomological dimension one. When we look at the the family of all finite subgroups, but the really hard part here is uh, if you want to apply this Shapiro argument that I talked about, you need to know that the cohomology of any finite group with respect to a proper a family of proper subgroups is greater than one. 
So we're used to thinking that finite groups have infinite kernelological dimension, but once you put this, um, put these fam these families of isotropy in, it's no longer true. Uh, for example, A5, the alternating group A5 with the family of all propers has kernelological dimension two. Uh, so we had to work hard to show that you can't have a finite group such that the kernelological dimension with the prop family of proper subgroups was one which was a bit surprising. Okay. Any questions? So that deals with the uh, dimension one case. What comes next? Dimension two. Um, so this is where I started to think about uh, equal variance equivariantly aspherical presentations of gamma groups. Okay, so suppose we have a, a gamma group G. Uh, what should be an equivariant presentation? It's a presentation where the generating set is X and the relation, set of relations is R, such that both X and R, which is a subset of the three group on X, are gamma sets. Okay, so gamma acts on X, so it acts on the free group on X, and uh, we want both, uh, we want the set of relations to be um, preserved. <laughs> these, I could only find one place in the literature where these occur, and it's a paper of Kasabov and Putman. Where they're interested in finite generation of the second homology of the Torelli group or or something like that. Um, and they look at um, finite equivariant presentations and use them to to see something there. But other than that, uh, no mention of this anywhere I could find. Um, now, this theorem here tells us that uh, equivariant geometric dimension less than or equal to one is equivalent to G has a, an equivariant presentation with R empty. <laughs> it says free with free on a, on a, on a gamma set. Uh, other examples, and here is the appearance of polyhedral products in some form or another. So we saw we saw in in the first talk yesterday that um, polyhedral products can have symmetries. Well, it's kind of obvious, but like uh, I think it the common way to Think of a group action on a polyhedral product is probably you have a group acting on the individual space pairs uh, and that induces a, an action on the whole thing but also you can have a group acting on the the underlying simplicial complex or flag complex and that's what i uh look at 
who actually already Ian and uh, Britain the Sinkis looked at these kinds of examples. So if I have uh, I was supposed to go over there next. I'm trying to have a good board strategy, but just forget where I'm going. So, uh, right this way. Yeah, so if you have a, a flag complex, and you have a group acting on it. And then you look at the standard presentation for the for the right angled art in group, then um, well, okay, a simplicial action. And of course it acts on the vertex set. And it acts also on the uh, the edge set. Uh, so this is an variant presentation for the the um, parting group. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I want to think about equivariant geometric dimension two. And so I want to think about when an equivariant presentation is, is going to give me uh, a classifying space of, of dimension two. So we define equivariantly. So a pre uh, an equivariant presentation is equivariantly a spherical If so, it needs to be an aspherical presentation, meaning that the presentation complex, which is a two-dimensional complex, has trivial higher homotopy. Well, you can just check pi two is, is trivial. But you also need that for all the, the fixed sub-presentations as well. So for all Q in gamma. I look at the, the Q fixed sub presentation. This is a an aspherical aspherical presentation of the fixed subgroup. All the elements of G fixed by Q. In other words, the presentation complex which I'll call K, which has one cells corresponding to the, the fixed generators and two cells corresponding to the fixed relators has pi one equal to the Q fixed elements of G and pi two trivial. Okay. Wondering about virtual presentation gives you an spherical two complex, two complex. Yeah. And if you take this the fixed set, is that also an aspherical two complex? Ah uh, yeah, so that was the next remark. And so if the if you take this sub presentation and it presents this group, then the induced map on fundamental groups is injective. And then it follows that this sub presentation of the aspherical presentation is itself aspherical. 
So that is in a survey paper on asphoricity by Hubishman and two other guys whose name escapes me right now. But uh, so I was going to remark. Right, so it's not quite the Whitehead conjecture. <laughs> it's the statement that if you have an aspherical presentation and you take a sub presentation such that the map on groups is injective, then that sub presentation is aspherical. So having answered that, I won't write that. I won't write that out. But I mean, it suffices to check that the presentation is aspherical and that the fixed sub-presentations present the fixed subgroups. No, but that's not guaranteed, right? Uh, you could have an equivariant presentation where the, the fixed sub-presentations present something else, I think, although I... <laughs> so I have an example. Maybe an example will arrive when I start doing examples. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so yeah, we're interested in, in this because of the following lemma, which I should probably call a proposition because it's the only result I've proved so far. Uh, how long have I got? Right. Um, Oh, I should have said actually in this result here, where is it? I should have, I left out an important assumption that gamma is finite. Well, I kind of assumed that at the start, but gamma has to be finite there. I don't know if it's true if gamma isn't finite, but the proof doesn't work. Uh, equivariant geometric dimension less than or equal to two if and only if G admits an equivariantly aspherical presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, let's go this way first. So if you have an equivariantly aspherical presentation, then you take K to be the presentation complex, <clears throat> and it has an action of gamma. And then you pass to the universal cover, and it has an action of the semi direct product. And then you want to see that the, uh, the isotropy, sorry, the fixed subgroup sub spaces are what you, what you need them to be. So, well, the zero cells here correspond to elements of G. The one cells in, in the universal cover here correspond to pairs B comma X, where X is generator and the two cells in pairs G comma R, where R is a relator. And the isotropy here, uh, well, gamma fixes the identity element of G. And so the isotropy of G itself will be the G conjugate of gamma. And yeah, if something's going to fix. Well, this is actually the G translate of E comma X, where E is the identity of G, uh, and that has isotropy, the, the isotropy of X, the generator. So it is, uh, <clears throat> this, and this is. This is this. In particular, we see that if uh, if a subgroup of the semi-direct product is not conjugate into gamma, uh, then it doesn't fix anything. So,
and actually you can you can fairly easily check that if h is is of this form where q is in gamma then what you get here is the g translate of the universal cover of the presentation complex of the q fixed sub presentation so uh, do, do, do. and we're assuming that this was an aspherical presentation so this is a contractible space we've translated it so this is contractible Okay. So going to get the way if you have where's my statement? The metric dimension two. So well, suppose that X is a classifying space for this family of dimension less than or equal to two. Uh, what you want to do is take G orbits and say that that is a presentation, an equivariant presentation complex. But unfortunately, as it is, there may be more than one G orbit of zero cells and a presentation complex has one zero cell. But there is a result by Martinez, Rosa, and Sanchez Saldana. which says that we can collapse uh, a G tree to get an X prime, which does have a single G orbit of cells. Gamma. Uh, here is where we need that the, uh, the gamma is finite because their result uses sort of the gamma. The family has maximal elements and stuff like that. Uh, well, actually, maybe check that, but I think we're using that gamma is finite here. And then you take the orbits of this guy. And check that this is a this is giving you a, an equivariantly aspherical presentation complex. So the fundamental group is G. It has a rigid, residual action of gamma. Um, both of these guys were contractible. Uh, okay, and I'm I'm omitting some details here. So how do you check that actually the uh, the, uh, the condition on the fixed subgroups. So I, I want to omit that to get onto some examples. Okay. So going back to the right angled art in groups. We have this equivariant presentation. And um, there's a theorem. Mm -hmm. 
future crisp which says um, in a specific case that the artin group associated to the q fixed points of l is isomorphic to the q fixed subgroup of q acting on the the artin group in the obvious way Uh, so this one has presentation vertices of the q fixed points of L, edges of the q fixed points of L, and that's isomorphic. Well, the groups presented. Mm -hmm. Isomorphic. So uh, this this thing here presents the the Q fix subgroup. Uh, okay, so then you just need to check when the presentation is aspherical, and that will be the case when L is a, a graph with no triangles. If Uh, the action is admissible. I think that's all you need to do. Nice, nice and special action. Okay. I was about to say something else. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that uh, the, the ordinary geometric dimension is a lower bound for the equivariant geometric dimension because if you have a gamma group G, the G acts freely on the equivariant class of being space because it doesn't intersect any of the conjugates of the base of this gamma group product. And I'm running out of time. Uh, so, so the other, another class of examples where we can exhibit an equivariantly aspherical presentation is cyclically presented groups. So I'm not going to write it, write up an example of a cyclic presentation. I guess most people know. So you have n generators. Uh, you pick a word in those generators, and you take the uh, cyclic permutations of that word. In fact, Vlad showed us the presentation of Higman's group, which is uh, an example. The A, B, C, D, and then the permutations. So there's a theorem of Bogley, which says that if the presentation is what's called orientable, I think that means that no sort of um, cycle of the word is equal to the inverse of the word or something along those lines. And combinatorially aspherical. Then the, the cyclic group acts freely on the non-identity elements. So the for any subgroup of the cyclic group, non-trivial subgroup of CN, the cyclic group, um, the fixed subgroup is trivial. Also, the fixed subpresentation is is empty because we're, we've got a free action on the generators. Uh, so in that case, we'd have equivalently aspherical 
Um, but what I really want to be able to do is say when a, a gamma group does not admit an equivariantly aspherical presentation, um, because I want to uh, disprove the equivariant eilenberg ganea conjecture. So if we take if we take L to be the two skeleton of the Poincaré sphere that was also mentioned yesterday, I think by me, uh, acted on by a five. I mean, this is a classic example, and and the associated Vesvina Brady group. Well, this Vesvina Brady group is a potential counterexample to Eilenberg Ganea, so it's known that. its cohomological dimension is two, but um, we also know that its equivariant cohomological dimension is two because the same acyclic two complex that exhibits this exhibits, exhibits this. And we would like to know, so if the, if the Whitehead conjecture is true, then this group is a counterexample to Eilenberg Ganea. And then of course um, that would mean because that would mean that the equivariant geometric dimension Is also three, so it would, I mean, it would in a, in a boring way, it would be a counterexample to the equivariant one. But I'm hoping that there's an easier way to see it might potentially using the equivariants be easier to see that this uh, cannot have an equivariant classifying space of dimension two. Uh, so that's kind of work in progress, but yeah, no, I think I'll stop there. Thanks.